Type 1 diabetes is a particularly challenging condition, one which requires significant inputs from both the physician and the entire medical team to ensure a successful outcome for a child. It's important to understand is that diabetes is not just a matter of science. It's not just about using insulin in appropriate doses, monitoring and measurement. It's also to a large extent an art on the part of physician to really work with the family in tackling so many issues which may be relevant in terms of both social, economic and other issues in terms of school empowerment and puberty. So it's a, a really complicated issue which requires compassion as well as skills on the part of a pediatrician to manage a child who has type 1 diabetes. So we'll start off with a case which is very unfortunate, it's still happening, but we are seeing that a 10-year-old boy with enuresis presented to a pediatrician who did a urine sugar which was 2 plus, a blood sugar was done which was found to be 320. Now this child was advised to undergo a glucose tolerance test, which is quite unusual, which is not entirely unusual. But if you look at the latest diagnostic criteria of diabetes, we all know a fasting sugar of more than 126 and a 2 hour glucose tolerance level more than 200 is diagnosed with diabetes. But what you really understand is that in presence of a classical symptoms, if a random sugar is more than 200 milligram per day, the diabetes diagnosis is pretty clear. So in majority of children with type 1 diabetes, the blood sugar levels are much higher than 200 and they present with classical osmotic symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia. And therefore, there is no role of doing an oral glucose tolerance test and this can really do a major harm because this may unnecessarily lead to the development of diabetic ketoacidosis in a non-ketotic child. So what happened in this child was that they were advised to do a GTT done on Saturday. The child was looking fine. They did a glucose tolerance test on Sunday. The reports were 340 and 560. And by Monday, by the time the child actually presented to us, the child had actually developed diabetic ketoacidosis. So this child who could have been started on insulin at the very moment of picking up a sugar of 320 unnecessarily had to go into DKA, had to be managed as far as the, the fluids and insulin infusion are concerned. And therefore, the key message that should come out of this case is that please do not ask for a glucose tolerance test in a child who comes to you with classical symptoms of diabetes and her blood sugar levels are more than 200. So this 10 year old boy with polyuria complains of weight loss, blood sugar is 430 and ketones is 3 plus. So what do you think is the diagnosis? Do you think this child requires a classification worker for the diagnosis is very clear? So we all know the different forms of diabetes and the most common form of diabetes in children by the way even now is type 1 diabetes which is caused by destruction of beta cells by autoimmune process resulting in insulin deficiency. More and more children particularly in the adolescent age group are now coming with obesity and uh, mild diabetes presenting as type 2 diabetes and then we have the entity of monogenic diabetes of young which is a classical genetic condition, autosomal dominant group of conditions presenting with lean phenotype, non-ketotic, sometimes milder form of uh, diabetes. So if you want to really classify, we need to understand that type 1 is by far the most common cause followed by type 2 and really Modi. Many features which clearly pre predict type 1 as in this case are the child actually presents to us with ketosis, with lean phenotype, and they can present a natch in all ages. Type 2 typically presents in a pubertal age group as just Modi, and Modi usually has a lean phenotype. The two tests which can be helpful in terms of distinguishing type 1 from type 2 diabetes are the GAD antibodies, which are positive in a substantial proportion of children who have type 1 diabetes but are absent in type 2 diabetes, and C peptide levels, which are markers of insulin secretion, which are low. In the setting of type 1 diabetes. What we also need to understand is that children who have type 1 diabetes uh, may have absent GAD antibodies, and particularly 20 to 30% of Indian children are not GAD positive. 
and C peptide levels may be low in the beginning in children who have type 2 diabetes because of the effect of glucotoxicity. So, although these parameters are of help in terms of distinguishing in most cases, they can be a significant overlap and therefore the holistic clinical picture should be taken into consideration and the management should be guided by the level of hyperglycemia and not really with being stickler to whether this is a type 1 or type 2 form of diabetes. So when do we need to classify a child? These investigations are not very cheap. They require a lot of resources and should only be done when they are required. So if you have a child who comes to you with obesity and akinthosis and we are thinking of type 2 diabetes, if there is no ketosis, if there is a strong family history and a possibility of modi is there and the onset happens before six months of age, we should consider the possibility of doing a diagnostic workup in this case. So we have this 14-year-old boy with weight loss, blood sugar is mildly elevated, ketones are absent, BMI is of the lean phenotype and there is a strong family history of diabetes. This is a classical case of what is known as monogenic diabetes of young. This is a 15-year-old child who presents to with extreme weight loss and emaciation. The blood sugar is very high and we can see there is a protuberant abdomen. There is no ketones which are present and triglyceride levels are very high. So what is this form of diabetes? Very high sugar, still ketone negative. And if you see the child, the child actually has no subcutaneous fat left. This is a classical situation of what is known as lipodystrophy, which behaves as an extreme form of obesity. So these children don't have any subcutaneous fat in which to store fat. So whatever extra fat comes to you, us is deposited in the liver and pancreas, resulting in severe insulin resistance, very difficult condition to treat, requiring high doses of insulin and quite challenging in that regard. Two-month-old boy with failure to thrive uh, was born with a birth weight of 1.8. Current weight is 2.1. High blood sugar levels and high triglyceride levels were seen. So what's the diagnosis? Is it type 1 diabetes? What's important to understand that typically type 1 diabetes is not expected to occur before the age of 6 months because it takes autoimmunity for really to have those features to develop. And this is the classical presentation of neonatal diabetes, which is an extremely challenging condition, very difficult to treat. But we now know that a substantial proportion of children who have neonatal diabetes actually have a potassium ATP channel defect, which are responsive to sulfonylurea. And uh, it's important to identify these individuals so as to achieve good response. 15-year-old boy with polyuria and we can see significant acanthosis which is there, high fasting in postprandial glucose, BMI of 28, ketones were present and GAD antibody was negative. C-peptide levels were low. So this is a very confusing situation of a child who presents to us with obesity and hyperglycemia, is ketotic but negative for antibodies and again a confounding picture whether it's a type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So when we do the evaluation, what we can see in terms of classification, the child is pubertal, favoring type 2, has VK, favoring type 1, is obese, favoring type 2, is uh, negative for GAR antibodies, again favoring type 2, but is low C-peptide. So it's a confusing situation and we are seeing the situation more and more often in children, particularly with obesity in young age groups. So conventionally, it has been considered that type 1 diabetes is... Uh, a volatile situation of insulin deficiency and type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance and insulin deficiency presents with ketosis while type 2 diabetes is non-ketotic. But now more and more children are presenting to us with complicated features like obese type 1 diabetes, type 1.5 diabetes and ketotic type 2 diabetes. And therefore, it seems that obesity is really changing the overall situation and these volatile pictures are now changing. And what we need to think about is that we should think of more in terms of what treatment is required rather than sticking to a diagnosis. So if you have a child who presents to us with features of type 2 diabetes but has a very high sugar, we have to start insulin. If you have an obese child who has type 1 diabetes, starting metformin may be a reasonable option to improve insulin resistance in that regards. So we have a 6-year-old boy with type 1 diabetes, weight is 24. 
HPA1C is 9.4 and a blood ketone was done which shows a non-ketotic state. So what should be done in this child now? And uh, we need to start off with possibility of starting insulin and it's an emergency for any child who comes to us with uh, diabetes. We have to really start off insulin otherwise this child will develop DK sooner or later. And in that regard we need to understand the insulin requirement which typically is to the tune of around 0.6 uh, unit per kilogram per day in the prepubertal age group goes up to around 1, 1 1.2 during puberty and then comes down to around 1 unit per kg per day thereafter. What is important to understand is that in the post DKA phase the insulin requirements may be as high as 2 to 2.5 units per kilogram per day. What we are aiming at is to mimic the physiological insulin secretion of a basal rate of insulin and secretion of insulin with each meals. What we need to understand is that whatever we do, we are never going to achieve a portal delivery of insulin, which is impossible. So we are trying to mimic physiology as much as possible. So what we really want in terms of management is a system which provides insulin, detects blood sugar, gives a titrated dose of insulin and shuts down automatically once the blood sugar levels go down. So this is what is known as the artificial pancreas or closed system which is on the making and hopefully over the next few years would be available but at the moment it's still a mirage for a child with diabetes. So we have a six year old boy with type 1 diabetes. So what are the options of insulin available and that becomes very important because now we have a plethora of options available. Traditionally we only had the regular insulin which was available. The Problem with regular insulin is that it forms hexamers and therefore it has delayed onset of action. It takes at least half an hour to act. So it is a problem if you are using particularly in toddlers because if you are starting off with the regular insulin, we have to wait for at least 30 minutes to act. And if you give a two year old an injection and you want to see how it responds, it becomes difficult. Therefore, it's required and recommended when there is a long gap as far as insulin therapy is concerned. Similarly, NPH insulin has been used a lot as far as intermediate acting insulin. Unfortunately, it has significant variability and has a clear, well defined peak. So, therefore, it's only used at the moment in a twice daily sort of a regime, but otherwise, it is often avoided in that regard. To overcome these problems, we now have the rapid acting onset uh, insulin like aspartyl, lispro and glulysine which are particularly useful for small children as a bolus insulin and we have long acting insulins like glargine and detimer which are peakless or with mild peak which are quite helpful as a basal insulin. What we should not use clearly in children is the premixed insulin because they are associated with unphysiological response variable response which is unpredictable resulting in brittle control. So six year old boy with type 1 diabetes. Now the next question is once we know about insulin as to which insulin regime should be decided and what we need to understand is that the decision for insulin regime should largely be based upon the socio-economic status, the education status, the motivation. So traditionally we have been using the mixed plate regime which basically uses a combination of an intermediate acting insulin and a short acting insulin given in the morning and evening. It has the advantage of using just two injections per day. The cost is also less. Typically, the insulin is associated with good response, but there are times when we have high levels of insulin and no meals. So there's a risk of hypoglycemia and therefore we require three major and three minor meals in this regime. The insulin distribution is typically two thirds in the morning and one third in the evening, with two thirds being an intermediate acting insulin and one third being the short acting insulin. More and more children are now being taken care by basal bonus regime, which involves a long acting insulin, which is given over 24 hours, and then we have short acting insulin, which is given along with meal. The basal bonus regime has the advantage of uh, providing more flexibility to the child. So if a child is having a late meal, the insulin can be given at a late stage. If it's given at an early time, we can adjust. So it's a more flexible regime which provides us better control in most situations with lower risk of hypoglycemia. The dose typically is around 50 to 60% as 
a bolus insulin and around 40 to 50 percent as basal insulin. We also have the option of insulin pump which is available which provides a larger uh, control as far as sugar is concerned. We can have uh, different basal rates at different times of the day and different types of boluses which can be given as per the means that we are taking. Diet is of a major concern. What we need to understand is that there is no special diet as far as diabetic uh, children are concerned. It's the healthy diet. So we want the child to have same thing that other peers should have in a routine fashion. And we need to consider the possibility of glycemic index and diet with have lower glycemic index actually would be more beneficial in this regards. So often a question comes to our mind is that can the child take rice and potato and the answer is yes. Can he have occasional cake and pastry in the party which can be allowed and we want more flexibility in terms of diabetes and diet management because rigid control would often impact growth and development and can really not have good long term impact in that regards. And the other issue is whether we can give sugar free products and in this regards most people will agree that we it's better to actually use sugar. But if you really want to use sugar free, it's not banned as far as children are concerned. So the next question comes to our mind is that once you have started insulin, what all other investigations should be done? And the initial investigation should include TSH, which can be done in diagnosis in a child who doesn't present with TK, but somebody who is sick, we are wary about sick youth thyroid syndrome. And in that regard, it should be done six weeks final post diagnosis. Eye examination for cataract is important, and we should also look at the role of uh, celiac disease autoimmunity because 10 percent children actually have celiac disease. We should also focus on diabetes education using a structured program so it has to be a team approach in which we need to discuss about the various forms and types of diabetes and uh, in terms of the treatment options with insulin demonstrate then the use of insulin regime nutritional and follow-up studies. Glucose monitoring also is extremely important. Most children will often ask as to how frequently should we monitor blood glucose and what should be the target levels. And in this regard, what we can say is that more the merrier and better would be to at least have four times daily insulin and blood glucose monitoring in the form of pre-meal and bedtime. And the targets also vary depending upon the age group. So in younger children, we are more liberal with the targets. But if you are able to achieve good control without hypoglycemia, we can be more aggressive. So now most people will say a figure of less than 7.5 is reasonable across the different age groups. Insulin adjustments are also to be done according to the pre-meal sugars and that we decide about how much snack and how much should be the dose of rapid and act long acting dose can be given. So let's start off with the follow up of this child at one month of treatment what we are seeing is that this child's sugars are fine with the exception of uh, high before dinner sugars and this child is actually on a combination of glargine and lispro. So a long acting and short acting basal bolus regime predominantly all sugars are going above at before dinner time. So what can be done and what's the problem? So what we are seeing basically is that typically these children would be eating sometimes in the evening in this grazing pattern result in a high levels at dinner so it's best to add another short acting dose at the time of uh, tea time and that will help us in terms of control. Three months later what we are seeing is that the child sugars are low across board all values have gone down so what's the possible cause? So this is a typical state of what we know as honeymoon phase which basically represents the recovery of uh, the self which were compromised because of glucotoxicity. The function after we have corrected that, it is typically of six to 15 months duration. And now we see that 18 months, this child is a 30 kilograms and we are seeing values which are high. And what we are seeing is values are high across board. So we have values which are high at breakfast, at lunch, dinner and bedtime. While with the same dose, we are seeing the values are normal in different times of the day. So what's going wrong here? And this is a typical situation of uh, a child who has fluctuating blood sugar at the same dose across board, possibility of lipohypertrophy, which is associated with significant compromise as far as insulin absorption is concerned, should be thought of. Now this child is on 
beyond honeymoon phase three year follow up weight is not gaining and what we are seeing is that even at a very low dose of around uh, 15 units of insulin his sugar they're going down so what's the cause of persistent hypoglycemia and we need to evaluate for that here Reduce insulin requirement in a follow-up period which suggests the possibility of malabsorption, hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency, renal dysfunction and, and TTG should be done along with TSH and cortisol in this setting. On follow-up, now the child is becoming uh, older and at 13 years of age, weight of 56 kgs, we are seeing the sugar levels are really going up, particularly the fasting sugars are high. And this is associated also with high levels of bedtime and uh, before dinner sugar. So what's the diagnosis here? So this is a typical case of what is known as Dawn's phenomena, which is caused by increased release of uh, hormones, particularly growth hormone, cortisol and androgens in the influence of puberty. And very common in this regards. So if your child has increased insulin requirement, peripuberty, morning hyperglycemia and high 2 a.m. sugars we should think of dawn phenomena and should further increase the dose in this setting what about follow-up the orphan child becomes sick what to do in that regard then sick day management is essential in this situation what we need to do is that we should ensure that the child does not stop insulin has enough to eat and frequently measures blood sugar children who have hypoglycemia should be given uh, sugar containing fluids and we decrease the dose of uh, the long acting insulin by around 20 to 50 percent children who have hyperglycemia should have their ketones measured and based upon their ketones we have to decide about how much extra dose of insulin is given so if there is ketone positive we have to give around 20 percent if it's mildly positive we give 10 percent of the total daily dose as a short acting insulin in that regards So we have a 17 year old girl with type 1 diabetes, high insulin requirement, resulting in significant weight gain, menstrual irregularity and hirsutism. What should be done? So this is a situation of insulin resistance and in this setting metformin may be considered to be helpful in this regard. What about type 2 diabetes? And type 2 diabetes is now increasingly being observed in children with uh, diabetes. What we need to understand is that we should not stick to whether it's type 1 or type 2. We should look at symptoms. So if you have a child who has severe hyperglycemia and acidosis, start on insulin and then think of shifting to metformin. Whereas the child doesn't have any features of, of DKA and the sugar levels are not very high, we should think of a possibility of managing just with metformin and gradually starting off with therapy.